The Be the Difference podcast is presented by Back to Back Ministries, a Christian nonprofit organization providing holistic care for orphan and vulnerable children and families around the world. To find out more about Back to Back or to follow on social media, head to backtoback.org. Welcome to Be the Different, stories of everyday people who are being the difference in the lives of others. I'm your host, Sammy Matthews, and I'm here with my co-host, Chris Cox. Good to be here with you, Sammy. Chris, today we are going to hear the story of a friend of yours named Joey Taylor. Can you tell us a little bit about what he does? Joey is all about reconciliation, relationships, and belonging. He's involved in a lot of different projects. We're going to talk about two of the projects that he leads here in Cincinnati. One is called Bespoken Live on Campus. The second is called Cuppa. Both come under the umbrella of Bespoken Live that he gets to co-lead with Brad Wise, a good friend of ours as well, and are directed toward storytelling environments that emphasize the listening aspect of story just as much as the telling of story. Bespoken Live on Campus is focused on middle school and high school students and creating environments for students to share stories. Cuppa is what it sounds like. It's a cup of coffee and conversation. And men and women join together from all over the city in order to have a conversation around their cup of coffee with Joey in the lead. As we jump into this conversation with Chris and Joey, we just want to give a quick warning that about halfway through the episode, Joey's going to tell a powerful story about the impacts of mental health and suicide on a particular community. It is a hopeful and redemptive story, but also maybe one that's hard to process. And so we just wanted you to be aware that that is coming and we hope that you will enjoy this conversation between Chris and Joey. Joe, I want to start this conversation around uh, the idea that we're surrounded by stories. Some we recognize, some we don't, some we're inundated with and we consume, and some we can't help but sit in. Uh, Joey, why is it important that we continue to tell stories? For, for me, the reason why telling our stories matters is because it helps us figure out who we are. As individuals, um, as a collective, stories surface identity, right? And in addition, stories help us to begin to hopefully work towards some healing, right? So it's not like self is the static thing that we're trying to discover as we unearth more and more stories from our life. Even the act of telling the story, in my mind, is, uh, is an act of healing when we begin to rehearse it and say, oh, wait a minute, there was meaning there. There was a thread there that connected to this part of my life. Oh, goodness, like this wasn't just a disparate, chaotic moment that had no other bearing or no other effect on the world or me. It really does connect in some way. And, um, and it was also hard maybe, or it was beautiful and it was good, but it was also meaningful. We're going to dig into some conversations around how story has impacted you personally and professionally. But I want to start there with with your story. Before you were working with Bespoken, what would have defined your life or what were you chasing during that time? Yeah, that's a that's a a difficult question because there's something that happened uh, kind of before before Bespoken that dramatically redefined who I have become who yeah. I am. And uh, it's a little bit weird for me to to continue to tell a version of this story, but it involves a cancer diagnosis and dramatic kind of uh, a dramatic process where I was essentially healed. Um, so, but before that, uh, that, which is the before bespoken moment, I wasn't a part of bespoken until after that happened. But before that moment, there was a There was a sense for me of being really driven, being very goal-oriented, and my goals were something around kind of interfaith engagement. I was living and working in the Middle East. Um, I thought I was kind of hot stuff doing that kind of work. (laughs) And um, yeah, I was on on a pretty good trajectory uh, professionally, personally, um, in terms of how I how I saw success, which was 
probably, if I'm being honest, pretty devoid of things like community or family or things that now I, I value so much, the most in my life. But at that point, it was really about the cool stuff I was able to do in the world, or at least the cool st- the, the, the things that I was projecting as cool stuff to other people that I was doing in the world. And uh, it wasn't until kind of the bottom fell out with the cancer stuff that I started to ask myself the difficult questions of who, who am I going to be if I can't be defined by my success or my work ethic or the cool stuff I'm doing in the world? Who am I actually going to be at the core? I remember so, so specifically one of my friends asked me to start to come and work for, them, work for him right at the end of the cancer stuff. Everything was getting better. The doctor was like, go back to life, go back to work. And he said, why don't you come and just yeah. try to do this thing? Be, it'll be uh, part-time, not a big deal. Come and do this thing. It'll be cool. And I was so nervous to say yes to it because I thought I would lose what I had gained um, in the process of being sick. And it, this is not to say, like, nobody should be sick. I don't want that for anybody. This isn't like this happened for a reason. Right. None of that stuff. Right. But I do know that I was able to find myself in a way that was completely distinct from the stuff I was able, I, I was doing or the things that I projected into the world. Um, yeah, and so there was a temptation. There was, there, was a fe- there was a fear that I would give into the temptation again to return to the kind of the pre-cancer um, conception of self. As you're making that shift, what types of difference were you looking to start making in that? Was there, was there a type of profession that you were starting to say, yeah, I, w- I kind of want to dive into this? Yeah, I mean, I think the, what I ended up doing with Bespoken and even the other stuff that I've been doing since, since I've been sick has all been about trying to instill inherent worth and um, unconditional belonging because that's what I need. Yeah. You know, that's what I need. And so when I'm able to witness to that or set space for that, for other people to do that for themselves, it's the... It's the most intoxic, intoxicating thing. It's the most, it's the thing that helps me believe that we're here for a reason. It's the thing that helps me have hope in the world. Um, it feels like that's the foundation for me for everything. I'm hearing what I think is describing a community of belonging or creating a space of belonging. Yeah. But so much of Bespoken Live on campus is hosted in places where students struggle the most for belonging, like public schools, um, after school program environments. How do you create a space where a high school student comes in and says, I'm here for this in just such a public forum like a school setting? So so one of the things that we do is we have these things called story listening guidelines. Yeah. Um, And so we say this space... um, requires courage and vulnerability. And because of that, we have these three ways of listening to stories. And actually, you all think you showed up for a storytelling workshop or whatever, but this is really about listening to other people's stories. Mm. And so the way we listen to stories at Bespoken is we do it in three ways. The first one is we listen with our bodies. So we say um, with our body posture, by nodding, by following along, by tracking, um, by laughing if somebody makes a joke, even if it's kind of lame, right? Yeah. Um, we show them with our bodies that we care. We want to hear more, you know. Second one is we listen to, with our imagination. Mm. So we, we try to invite um, empathy through imagination because there's all this research that indicates that imagination actually cultivates empathy. And so um, depending on the context, I'll go into more detail there. But um, really I'm asking the students to, when they listen to other people's stories, to picture what they're, what the other person is saying, mm-hmm. to try to feel what the other person is saying, um, to fill in the details, even if they're not necessarily talking about the color of the sky or, um, you know, what it smells like. Try to actually enter into the story. And, of course, there's limits to that empathy. That st- person's story is still their story, but yeah. the intention of trying to enter into the story is so important. And the third and final thing, I think this might be the most important part, is when somebody is finished, I say there shouldn't be crickets. There shouldn't be crickets. Okay. There should be an eager response where you respond in kindness and gratitude. So we give a little script normally. Thanks for sharing. The part I'm grateful for is this part. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and for th- it's just amazing what happens in that space because there are some there are some young people who don't want to tell their story, but who love to respond to other people's stories. Really? Yeah. 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 Do you find that there's a tendency there of uh, with those principles in play? that the response actually holds the other person's story uh, in in that thin space? Or do you have a lot of efforting to one-up the storyteller's story? Yeah, yeah, you're setting me up. So there's a couple of coaching points that we do there. So the, the first thing is that we say, this isn't a space for advice. Mm. So you're not trying to tell people what to do with their story. You're just trying to honor the story that you've heard. Um, and you're going to feel, and we always say, you're going to feel compelled to try to say, yeah, me too. I went through that also. Yeah. But just refrain for just a little bit from doing that. Because, of course, there's some things that you can relate to. But for a second, we want that person's story to be their own story and to honor that story. Mm. So, you know, the, the, whenever I talk about my cancer stuff, people are always like, my aunt had cancer. And I'm like, oh, really? Great. Thanks. Yeah. You know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> that makes me feel so much better, you know, like, uh, um, so, so I'm like, don't do that. Don't do that. But instead, just look for something that you're grateful for in their story. Mm. It can be something as simple as the courage you showed, the way, um, the way you stood there and told your story. Um, it can be uh, the tear, you know, that came out of your eye. It can, it, or it can be content, like, man, the way you threaded those things together, the way you, you ended your story. Um, that, vis- that, that visual that you gave, that little turn of phrase, whatever. And, and I think that helps it, the story to be held and not to be objectified because um, it's really easy to objectify it, especially because we're consuming stories all the time and um, it's easy to ask, what is the story doing for me? Yeah, you know? yeah so. that, that drew in the question that I wasn't sure if I would – even have the ability to ask you today was, as you just mentioned, you know, we're getting stories all the time in, in 30 second frameworks of a TikTok to a minute to you know, two and a half hour movies, or we're trying to binge watch an entire series in a day, right? Like we've got yeah. story framed in, su- in such a certain way that I wanted to ask the question, is story a tired concept? Yeah, I think story is uh, ubiquitous. Mm. There's no way you can. It's it's um, all encompassing. As humans, we are storytelling animals, mm-hmm. storytelling beings. There's no way to escape it. Um, the frame of story, this this uh, this kind of overarching word, now in this moment captures so many things that sometimes can mean nothing. Yeah. Um, but We typically, like when I'm teaching the storytelling workshop, I would talk about a story as meaningful actions of characters over time. But really the important part there is that a story happens in a moment, right? In a moment. Mm. It doesn't happen through statements, through thoughts, not even through beliefs. No. It happens in a moment at a specific place with specific people. And there's meaningful things that happen in that moment. As you're thinking about the the school environment and uh, the groups of teenagers that you have gathered, is there a moment that you can remember a word that was the prompt for a given day that that created that thin space that you thought, I just want to stay here and hear more of this or um, engage more deeply in these moments? There's a there's a story that that's really been like sitting with me recently. Um, so there's a there's a farm up in Mount Healthy called Takoon Farm, and it's this it's this crazy place in the middle of Mount Healthy. Mary, who runs this place, is like just the most hospitable person I've ever met in my life, and she has these incredible ideas and just kind of puts them into action. Um, so she was running these after school programs for a little while. She called them trauma informed after school programs, and there was there's yoga and. Um, there's alpacas on the farm, so they go and hang out with the animals. And, um, you know, they have fiber arts and they have a ton of stuff. And one of the things they did was with me, and we would, we would tell stories. And there was, a, there was a young lady. Man, she is just so talented. Like, we started doing the story stuff, and she says, hey, I actually write poetry. She starts, 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 she starts to show me her poetry, and um, it's heavy. 
Mm. It's like heavy. I'm like, what's going on here? And she starts to tell me that she's had some issues with mental health and has kind of been in and out of the hospital and that kind of stuff. And But all the other kids look up to her. They love this girl, love her. Um, and so we, you know, we had to stop last year because of the pandemic and everything. And the after school program was put on hold. And about in December, um, Mary calls me and she's like, have you heard? Have you heard what's going on or what happened? I'm like, no, I didn't hear what happened. And she said, this girl killed herself. So um, I, mean, I, was cl- I was close with her. <laughs> I was, I mean, she, yeah. yeah. And it, and it made me so angry because I'm like, I, it wasn't like it wasn't like me who was saving her from from that. No way. But I do know this community at Takoon, um, the community of her friends. Those things were so essential for her well being, and it was stripped from her. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's been sitting with me a lot. So we so we had this event. Things are starting to open back up. Mary, being who she is, um, pivoted with the pandemic and started doing food distribution for a, for a bunch of families in Mount Healthy, and um, with Mount Healthy Schools and Takoon and a couple other organizations, we uh, did this event called Pandemic to Promise, and we had six storytellers, poets, rappers, and we walked them through this three-part storytelling framework that mm. before the pandemic, the pandemic eve kind of story until one day when the pandemic felt really real for them mm. and, and the and now. Uh, and the and now part is like, what do they see now for themselves and for their community? What does hope look like? Pandemic to promise. What's the promise? So we did this performance. One of the um, young people who was performing was a drummer. And this drummer, um, I, I don't think, yeah, th- this drummer just felt like a little bit shy and maybe a little uncomfortable being up there. And we were, we were, uh, record, we were trying to prepare for the event beforehand. And um, he had a djembe and he was going to play, mm-hmm. right? And he wanted me to put on the, the speaker like Black Sabbath or something, and he was going to play his djembe to it. I'm like, dude, no one cares about Black Sabbath. <laughs> Just play your djembe. Yeah. We don't care about Black right. Sabbath, you know? And um, so he's like, okay, okay. So I'm, I'm like, why don't you just put in your headphones and you can play the djembe. It'd be good. It's like, sounds good. So he plays, the, he plays the djembe and he's like a crowd favorite. People love him. So it comes to the end of the, the, end of the, the event and I'm supposed to close it all out. Mm. But I'm like, these people don't want to hear me talk. I mean, I just heard these six students perform plus this dude playing on the drums. Look at them. Let's get them back up here. So I said to them all, what do you all see as the promise for the community now? And as the pandemic is starting to kind of slowly starting to close and the world is starting to open back up, what do you see? And we pass the mic around. But the drummer doesn't, doesn't take the mic. So I say, hey, do you, wanna, do you wanna say anything? And he like very kind of gingerly reaches out for it. I'm like, you don't have to if you don't want to. He's like, no, 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 I want to. Okay. He holds the mic for a second, takes a deep breath in, puts his, puts his finger up to the sky, and he mm. says, this is for that girl that mm. died. And everybody, I mean, I've got chills, mm. you know. It wasn't something we, we, we rehearsed. I didn't think he would even want to talk, you know. Um, but I do know there was this recognition that everybody had been incredibly affected by the pandemic. This wasn't a cognitive exercise. Yeah. We, we had lost somebody. And we needed to say that, mm. you know. I want to respond by saying thank you for opening up your heart. I can hear it in your voice Yeah. that you took us to a moment there and I could feel the loss and yet from pandemic to promise gave me hope in the same in the same story i i don't know what to do uh with what you just created other than to say thanks for opening up that possibility that um acknowledging a story that 
didn't end the way we would want it to end while also proclaiming a story that's still going in the same moment. I think that was just beautiful, yeah. and I just wanted to say thank you for like giving us that yeah, moment. Sure. Yeah, thanks for thanks for asking and for listening. I I mean I for me it's easy to frame hope or promise or whatever the the future in terms of um a complete lack of suffering or something. But um I think things like hope, things like belonging have to figure out a way to incorporate the hard stuff. One of my favorite writers, uh, Henry Nouwen, talks about how true community can only be found through a shared confession of brokenness. Mm. And that just resonates so deeply to me. I want to talk for a minute about cuppa. I am always down for a good cup of coffee. <laughs> I think that's what cuppa means is like a cup of coffee. But can you tell me a little bit about this project? We started to create this space on Wednesday morning that we imagine as a midweek Sabbath. Um, so at 8 a.m., it was in person at first. Now it's all on Zoom. Okay. People are supposed to bring a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. We were buying coffee before, but now we don't have to anymore. Yeah. So, um, And we start with a little reflection. But then we break up into groups of threes and fours, and we invite people to remember who they are through their stories, other people's stories. Um, we always end with gifts where we talk about what was meaningful for us during the interaction. Mm. Um, and then we have this little, like, we call it a belief statement, which is just sort of a funny way of saying that we think stories matter. And um, I do this thing where I put it in the chat and I say, whose turn is it to read it? I want somebody else to choose to read it because I don't I, – I, as much as I possibly can, as much as we possibly can, we want this space to be held collectively, okay. not individually, right? So even the reflection, at first it was being done by me and Brad, and now it's, it's held by the entire community, right? So, yeah. so this is not a space that we're producing. It's, this is a space literally that we're creating the Zoom link for. We have a little ritual that we do, but – but people are filling in because it's theirs, it's ours, it's not, it's not mine. So um, be, because of that, I, I mean, I could totally share this belief statement, but why don't, why don't you read this belief statement, Chris? Why don't, um, why don't I do half and you do half? Does it work like that? Because I'd love it to does. share this with you. Yeah, yeah. But you can just read maybe up to the, the wave. At Bespoken Live, we believe in good stories, the stories that punch us in the gut, squeeze tears out of our eyes, make us laugh like we're free, and make our hearts beat and brains wave. We believe we discover who we are by knowing each other's stories. We move toward healing to tell our stories out loud. And when we choose to listen with kindness and imagination, something transcendent happens. We come together to share stories because it's the best way we know to spark contagious hope and belonging. Uh, we always read that as the, at the end, and it's the most it's the most important ritual of my life right now. Wow! Yeah, that's a that's a profound statement about a midweek you know morning experience. Yeah. There's just this sense there's there's this real sense of belonging that I'm seen and known that I can extend that to other people, um, and also it's just. It's it's free. You don't have to pay for pay for anything, so it doesn't feel like it's it's not market driven. Yeah, just like here's a free thing. Um, it's meaningful for me. I think it'll be meaningful for you as well. Yeah, I love that you would say the ritual that has a point for everyone just to be together is the most important moment of your week. Mm -hmm. Because I think in your own story and what I know about you and what I've seen in the stories that have come out from. Uh, bespoken live on campus from Cuppa, from other communities, uh, especially interfaith communities that have yeah. come together. You are a definition of what it looks like just to hold other stories. And on behalf of the stories that you won't ever hear that are just written in a high school student's journal that they got at one of your events <laughs> that they needed to express but never show anyone. And from your most deeply rooted friendships that have been on this journey all the way with you, yeah. I know sometimes we don't get to respond in gratitude and kindness to thank you 
for making your life about creating space for us to be fully seen and known. And on behalf of all of our friends and this community, I just want to say thank you. Damn, that was good. That was an incredible conversation with Joey and just taking a note from him and their listening guidelines and a way to respond in gratitude and kindness. Just, I want to say thank you to Joey for sharing his story. A part that really stood out to me was right in the beginning where he was kind of talking about his life pre-bespoken. And he talked about a lot of things that he was doing. And to me, it sounded like he was doing things for God. And the way that there was this shift of doing things for God to doing things with God. Yeah, knowing Joey the way I I do, I would say he was probably say he was doing things for himself. And then God did something with him, even through that cancer season, so that then he wanted to do something with God. And I kind of heard that thread as he was talking of, I was doing this for me, and this is what what success looked like. I resonated with that. He almost wanted to skip past the cancer part of the story. And that really stood out to me as well of not wanting this moment to define him. And I, I appreciated that. Yeah, I think it's interesting to think about, like, as we're on this journey of figuring out how to be the difference in other people's lives, how we can discern, like, am, am I doing it to earn something and, like, earn approval of others or of of God? Or am I doing it to to be with God and what he's already doing? And God is a storyteller. And I think Joey engaging in story is inviting us into what God does, which is tells stories. Yeah. Was there another part of the story or even the process that Joey shared that you'll utilize as a takeaway for today? Yeah, I think his listening guidelines Mm -hmm. in general of like holding space for a story, responding in kindness and gratitude, and that my story doesn't have to supersede the next story. Like those are really just good life skills for listening to one another. I find that true. With I have a 15-year-old daughter and as, as Joy was sharing the listening skills, I think I can continue to do better at even asking her, like, do you want me to hold this story with you? Or are you asking me for, my, for advice? Mm-hmm. Right? That consent, because I think there's a, there's a place where people are coming to us and telling us things because they do want some feedback. But I'm not sure that I've asked or given that consent to say, yeah, I want you to weigh in now or just hold this with me. So it was a real big takeaway for me of those same listening principles to say, Am I asking people um, if they want me to weigh in? And no matter what, weigh in or not, I could always start with responding with gratitude and kindness. Even when I disagree in stories, what Mm -hmm. would it look like for me to start with? Thank you for sharing that with me. The part that stood out to me was this because I've never seen it from that vantage point. It would really change our conversations. Yeah, I I was also just really struck with the idea of how telling a story can make a difference in a person's life, like that they get to tell their story and not just once it's cleaned up and even like tied up with a bow, like that we could invite people to tell their stories that are still in process, that aren't um, finished yet. Yeah, they haven't been honed, they haven't been edited, like unedited versions are beautiful too. I I love that. If we even think about like social media and filters that go on pictures and the way that what's projected is the highlight reel. And I think there can be this message that those are the only kind of stories we're supposed to tell. And how powerful would it be to be a person who invites someone else? And I think that's what Joey does, is invites people to tell their stories in in brokenness. Yeah, the things that aren't safe, the vulnerable stories, the things that aren't clean, the conversations that we're not sure how they're going to sound coming out of our mouths. When we have communities that are safe for us to tell these stories, it seems like there's a journey toward healing. I want to be a person who invites other people to tell me their story, even when they don't have all the answers. And like you said, I I want to be a person that doesn't just throw advice on it, but asks if I can offer it if I haven't. And if not, just hold the space and be grateful. I think there is, like you said, healing that happens. And I want to be a a place and a person that invites healing. For For us as a community, as we continue just to grow, I think leaving this conversation knowing that story listening is even more important than storytelling is a great takeaway for us. Uh, Listening to stories with your imagination, responding in gratitude and kindness are all great takeaways that we could have today. 
And what I leave us with is to know that this platform of Be The Difference as a podcast is a place for us to hold story and we get to keep coming back together. So as an audience, we're glad you keep coming back to hold stories with us. We're grateful for Cohatch Mason to create space where we can tell and listen to each other's stories. And if you want more about Bespoken live on campus or Cuppa, we'll have a link in the show notes. And these Wednesday gatherings are open for anyone to join even now. We'll see you on the next episode.